we'll start with a little bit of your personal life because you started life as Martin. That's true. And are now Martine. Correct. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> You've got two minutes, Joe. Just kidding. All right. Well, it's um, it's just sort of a journey of uh, gender exploration, what we call today being transgendered, and generally allowing your internal uh, gyroscope of where you feel your gender identity is to express itself, notwithstanding society's efforts to shove everybody into either a male or female box. And that has driven a lot of, of, of what you're working on today in terms of thinking about science and technology and how it can shape the world going forward. I mean, generally, I think that there are definitely some real boundaries in life that people have to respect. I look at those mostly as like the laws of physics, but um, or the laws of society which are created. But within those boundaries of either the laws of society or the laws of physics, there are many borders that we make artificially for ourselves. And I think it's beautiful when people transcend those borders, such as, you know, transmitting energy through the air. Um, that was a border that everybody said couldn't be passed. And we just saw before us um, that that was not a boundary, but just a border that you could walk over and transcend. And you yourself have done this multiple times. You've constantly reinvented the work that you're doing. You began with Sirius Satellite. How did you come up with that idea? So it was um, really a fascination with satellite earth stations and wondering why the satellite dishes that we see sometimes at cable TV headquarters are so large. And I learned that it was because the satellites that were transmitting to them had such weak power. There's no place to plug in a satellite. There's no nuclear power sources for satellites. And I began wondering if we could make the satellite more and more powerful and focus the energy more and more on a specific part of the Earth, such as the United States, then in turn, the satellite dishes could be made smaller and smaller. And ultimately, you can imagine just taking a flat section of a big satellite dish, it would be almost flat. As your section got smaller and smaller, eventually it would be flat. It could fit conformally in the roof of a car. And ta-da, Sirius XM. Which, it's so interesting that you talk about it that way, because so many people, if they started radio in a different form, would be thinking about the content. They'd be thinking about that angle. Did that part of it cross your mind? The content part crossed my mind, especially when I began trying to persuade other people to invest in this project. Uh, one of the first uh, things that people brought up was that, well, who's going to financially support this? And uh, my response was that people would pay for this content because the choices on the FM and radio band were quite limited. If you were really into, um, for example, Howard Stern is perhaps an iconic example. If you were in a city that had Howard Stern, great. But if you were not, you know, there was, there was no Howard Stern. And by collecting people's desire to listen to that content, people were willing to pay 14 bucks a month. And now we have, you know, millions of listeners of Howard throughout North America. And that's actually the largest group of people that come up to me and thank me for Sirius XM. <laughs> he should be thanking you. It's been great well, for him, he has, too. He has. He's been very generous. So he's been great. And it was, I mean, financially, uh, it was a wonderful thing for you as well. You could have essentially signed off on life at that point and continued on that path. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, your daughter came down with a life-threatening disease. And you decided you were going to change that, that you were going to address that because there was nothing out there to address it. Exactly, Rebecca. She came down with pulmonary arterial hypertension. It's a life-threatening disease between the lungs and the heart. She's our, our youngest daughter, fourth uh, kid, so it was quite unexpected. Everybody else was healthy, and she was healthy up until then. Um, my first thought was, I think, that doctors are supposed to take care of this. But the doctors told us that she would need a lung transplant within three to four years. And, um, and that even that lung transplant was just a, a short purchase of time until she rejected it. I thought that surely there must be a pharmaceutical company working on something. And um, I went and did research. And I found out that uh, nobody was working on anything because the number of patients with this condition was so few was at that time just 3,000 patients in the whole United States. 
that no pharmaceutical company could make a business on a medicine for just 3,000 patients. So um, the next thing I thought of was that, well, why don't I use some of our money from SiriusXM to create a medical research foundation and we'll give grants to scientists and surely scientists will come up with a cure. I mean, that's what scientists do. So I did that for a couple of years and really progress was getting nowhere. The people came up with kind of, you know, very beautifully written proposals. Um, but two years later, Genesis was mostly in the intensive care ward, that's the name of our daughter, and the medicines that were promised were actually not even one month closer. They were still as far away as the day when I gave them their first grants. Um, I don't fault the scientists, you know, moving biology around is not difficult, it's not easy. But one of the scientists was very honest with me, uh, Dr. Barst from Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. She said, Martine, everybody in our little field loves your generosity, but it's not going to produce a medicine in time for, for your daughter. There is a medicine that was developed at Glaxo Wellcome, um, but they kept it experimental and they won't further develop it because the number of patients is too small and they have a policy of only going after blockbuster diseases, ones that'll produce a billion dollars or more in, in revenues. Surely you, with all of your satellite communications expertise, you could go to Glaxo and get that medicine out of them and develop it for your daughter. I was like, right. I mean, <laughs> you know, I was like, I, I, I thought she was crazy, to tell you the truth. Um, I, I had never even taken biology in college. The last biology course I took was in 10th grade. But um, I had no choice. Uh, my soulmate, Bina and I, Genesis's mother, you know, we'd be crying. Uh, Genesis herself said, can't you do something for me? Um, so I basically just threw myself headlong into biology. I got like basic college biology textbooks and then medical textbooks and then journal articles. And I would read back and forth, you know, whenever I didn't understand anything, I went back to the college level, then went up to the journal level. I went down to Glaxo. I begged um, for them to license me this medicine. Um, at first they said no. Uh, at second they said no. But one of my favorite adages is that people always say no before they say yes. So um, I keep bugging, I kept bugging them and I built up a credible team of people. I got a Nobel laureate, Sir John Vane, to join my scientific advisory board. And finally, they agreed to license me the medicine for um, $25,000 and 10% of revenues. They thought this was just get Rothblatt off our floor. <laughs> I mean, they, they had thought there was absolutely no prospect of this medicine ever being developed into a drug. Um, and it's so funny because we have now paid them hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, royalties of their 10% royalty. Sales are over a billion dollars a year. The number of patients is now over 30,000, so 10 times more patients. All of those are people who just would not be alive um, without these medicines. <laughs> and I must add as a coda, best of all, um, is the inspiration for all of this. Our daughter, Genesis, uh, she just turned 30, and uh, she's in charge of telepresence and uh, digital screenage at all of our companies, helps everybody work together to develop better and better treatments. One component that I found very interesting about United Therapeutics is also the idea of payment. It is a business. Yes. It has to be profitable. Yes. But you also are making sure that people who come to you in need are getting that help regardless of their ability to pay. Correct. We faced a uh, fundamental business dilemma at the beginning. Um, Glaxo was, in, in a sense, right based on what people paid for medicines in the 1990s. Uh, you could not support the cost of drug development for a uh, drug that treated 3,000 patients. Um, but fortunately, I, I did have a legal um, background, too, from UCLA Law School. So I looked into my own Blue Cross Blue Shield contract, and I saw that they said that they wouldn't pay for cosmetic surgery, they wouldn't pay for experimental medicines, but there was no price cap on what they would pay for something that was, quote, unquote, medically necessary treatment. So I just really did the math. I said, okay, you know, 
what net present value um, do I need to satisfy investors that they'll get a good return on their investment? How many patients are there? Divide the number of patients into that amount of money. What must be the cost of the drug? It turned out it had to cost $100,000 a year. At that time, there was no medicine costing $100,000 a year. And um, I, I think many people in our little biotechnology industry should maybe thank me for the fact that now there's like a couple dozen medicines that cost more than $100,000 a year. But fortunately, that means that there are thousands of people with orphan diseases that would have never got their, their diseases treated. And biotech companies that treat orphan diseases are now amongst the most profitable and, su and successful segment of the pharma industry. I do wonder, um, and this is sort of a curveball question that we didn't talk about before, but you brought it up, so I want to ask about it. The idea of the venture community of funding going towards these businesses that have very big but untested and potentially very expensive to get their ideas. How difficult, if you were starting all of this today, do you think it would be more difficult or easier given the way of the world as it stands today? Um, I think it would be pretty much equivalent. Um, there, people are always disbelieving until something is created for them. And there's this great expert, this great saying by Arthur C. Clarke, uh, the famous science fiction writer who discovered geostationary satellites. He said, um, if a wizened expert in a field, which are either VCs or the consultants that VCs hire to advise them, tells you something is impossible, uh, they are almost certainly wrong. And if a wizened expert in the field tells you something is possible, they are almost certainly right. So these VCs, they're risk averse, and it will always be difficult. What's needed is to be practical, to make a prototype, to show people that, that this is practical, to be persistent, to be ready to march through 99 no's for that one yes, and to finally communicate your idea in a stepwise, sensible fashion. And entrepreneurs are doing this today. They did it 20 years ago. Actually, they did it 200 years ago. If that wasn't enough, you are now also focusing on what I would say is somewhat of a new venture. You're, you're looking into software, and you believe that software will have consciousness. That's right. Yes, Rebecca. The, um, I'm really inspired by the exponential growth in um, information technology. Ray Kurzweil, the author of Age of Spiritual Machines and The Singularity is Near, he's on our board of directors. Um, and uh, he has actually you know, had a very successful track record in terms of predicting new inventions that will come about as a result of the exponential growth in IT technology. So it seems to me that the natural extension of Ray's ideas is that we will get to a point where uh, software is so sophisticated and so capable that uh, it will do its best to persuade us that it's conscious. And at the beginning, everybody will say, no, you're not conscious, you're just a smart puppet. Uh, hackers and makers and software companies and DARPA contractors will work harder and harder and harder to make this consciousness uh, more and more um, affable, more feelable, more real. And uh, there will come finally a tipping point when you can have a, a group of psychologists that would spend a year with a software mind, and after a year, that group of psychologists would say, this software mind is as human as any person, although it lacks a body. Do you ever consider the downside of that? Sure, absolutely. Um, there's, um, there's you know, the possibility of crazy software minds. And um, in fact, about 1% of all human births result in a condition, a psychological condition where um, people just have a lack of affect and even a uh, antisocial, antisocial uh, behavior type of disorder. But, you know, fire was used to burn people and they used fire to say, if you're telling the truth, then your hand won't burn when you put your hand. Those just horrible, horrible things have been done in the name of fire, but our whole society is, is based on fire. So I believe that the answer to the negative face of technology is to emphasize the positive face of technology, build better and better positive technology, create safe harbors for positive technology, because ultimately it will take a good software mind to catch a bad software mind.
it is said that you want to knock down the wall between, between biological and digital life and death. What does that mean? Well, one very practical way that we're doing that right now, Rebecca, is in a partnership between our company, United Therapeutics, and Craig Venter's company, Synthetic Genomics and Human Longevity, Inc., where we're using the uh, biological to digital and digital to biological expertise of Human Longevity, Inc. and Synthetic Genomics to decode the pig genome. Now, the pig genome uh, results in organs like hearts and lungs and kidneys and livers that are the best size match for human organs of any animal in the animal kingdom, even better matched to us than chimpanzees without the associated ethical issues. So we believe that our partnership with uh, human longevity and synthetic genomics will allow us to make enough tweaks and changes in the pig genome using digital to biological and biological back to digital techniques that we can create an unlimited supply of transplantable organs, starting with the lung and the heart. And this means that when people reach uh, the point of having end-stage heart disease, end-stage lung disease, instead of like, you know, just calmly marching off to death, instead they can say, hey, when my car needs a, a new engine, I replace it. We've got um, B-52 bombers that are still flying, built in the 50s, but so many parts have been replaced they're older than even the grandparents of some of the pilots. So we can replace our lungs and our hearts with an unlimited supply of transplantable organs, thanks to being able to walk back and forth from digital to biological. We'll be talking with Craig in a minute more yeah. about this project, but uh, it's, it's interesting because it, on some levels this goes back to Genesis. Yes, it does. Because still with people with pulmonary hypertension and, and our daughter Genesis, they all take a handful of pills each day uh, most people with pulmonary hypertension, ultimately, they progress, their disease keeps progressing through the um, treatment. And the only absolute cure is a lung transplant. But as most people know, people end up rejecting the lung transplant. It's a similar situation with pulmonary fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, emphysema, even lung cancer. So what we believe we can do is by tweaking the pig genome, uh, using these digital and biological techniques, we can create a lung which is tolerable by the human body so the patients will not have to take lifelong immunosuppressants and replacing one's lungs will be a true cure for end-stage lung disease. You are also a futurist. What do you believe is the future for humans? I believe the future for humans is um, taking the quality of life that um, we've built up among most of the people in the West and spreading that um, over more and more people. I'm a huge believer in Peter Diamandis' uh, thesis of abundance. I think that uh, the um, positive thinking and uh, hope and belief in working hard in science and technology um, can overcome any problem. Yes, we have horrible problems, the Ebola pandemic in West Africa, the uh, ISIS nihilism in, uh, in the Middle East. However, if you look back in history, things were always worse. I mean, there were times when people just marched across, you know, all of Near East and, and Europe and burned everything, burned people in their homes, and nobody could do anything about it, would do anything about it, would even know about it in distant parts of the world. We have now built a global network of mankind, which is our satellite and internet communications capabilities. We're creating a global empathy through meetings such as this zeitgeist and, and journalists like you who can channel our stories to hundreds of millions of people. And we're building a global capability to get together and do something with organizations like the World Health Organization, the United States now sending thousands of soldiers into uh, West Africa to try to contain this uh, pandemic, many countries working together to contain ISIS. All of this is signs that we are, you know, legions away from utopia, but things are getting better all the time, and I believe the future will continue to get better and better. What is the one story you think needs to be told that's not getting attention today? That's, a, that's an amazing question, but I would say, um, you really caught me, I Sorry. caught me on that <laughs> one. But I would say actually the, the story of, um, of the individual who is facing something that seems to be an absolute boundary, life or death, using their capabilities of communication, like the presentation yesterday with the uh, young man dying from a sarcoma and using his ability to make beautiful music 
to marshal the talents of people throughout the world to come up with cures for those disease. I think those are the stories that need to be told, that um, there is no limit to uh, channel the, the great spirit of Audrey Hepburn. Nothing is impossible because the word itself says, I'm possible. The Martine Rothblatt story. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you.